Okay, Tarek, can you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Do you want to start the presentation? Yes, please. Can you share us your presentation? Okay. You see my uh, presentation right now? Not yet. What about this? Do you see my presentation? No, not yet. So I have shared it with you. I will re-share it again. It's in the share button. Yes, I used it. Share and share the screen and I have selected the, my PowerPoint file and clicked on share, but there is a problem here. Okay. I don't know what is the problem. We did everything. Okay. Uh, correctly. You still uh, not seen my uh, presentation? No, not yet. Can you try again, please? Yes. I'm trying over and over. What about now? No. I don't know. I am using a Google Chrome browser. Do you think I should use another one? Let me try uh, to use the Edge. Microsoft okay. Edge. Thank you. I'm joining from the my Edge browser. What about you? Yes. Do you see my presentation? Yes. Okay, that's great. Let's keep the Edge browser then. So, <clears throat> okay. So hello everyone and thank you to all who contributed to making this conference a successful one. Today I'm excited to present an innovative approach that leverages machine learning and deep learning techniques with a focus on projected long short term memory networks for diagnosing anemia based on complete blood count data. The title of this presentation underscores the importance of fine tuning neural networks there using a case statistical metric which is called the coefficient of determination, uh, known by the R square, to enhance the model's precision. This approach Excuse is me, designed Tarek. to significantly improve both the accuracy. Excuse and me, the Tarek? Yes. Tarek, can you put your presentation in presentation mode, please? Yes, I have to use it this way.
What about now? Do you see it? Um, can you uh, put F F five if I find F five? Yes, for full Is screen okay? mode. Is this okay from your side? Uh, it's not in full screen mode, the presentation. Uh, what about now? I need to read from my comments. Is this way fine? Is, is. You have what to, about that? You have to press the presentation mode. What did you say? You have to, to press the presentation button, the presentation mode. Okay. We have the full screen. What about now? No, it's not yet. I think I'm following everything correctly. I don't know where, where, where the problem is. What do you suggest to do? Okay, just continue, please. Okay. So, let's move to the second. So, anemia is a, a global health concern that affects millions of people worldwide. It occurs when there is a, a deficiency in red blood cells or hemoglobin which are crucial for transporting oxygen through the body. Anemia can lead to serious health problems such as fatigue, weakness, and impaired cognitive and physical development. As we see in uh, this representation, the image provides a visual comparison. So it shows that the difference between normal blood cells and anemic blood cells highlighting the diminished count and size of uh, red blood cells in anemia. So uh, it also compares a normal hand with a hand affected by anemia, which is often appear pale due to the lack of oxygenated blood. Lastly, this figure or this presentation illustrates common symptoms of anemia, such as fatigue and weakness, and further emphasize the importance of early and accurate diagnosis. So the goal of this study is to improve the diagnostic process for anemia by utilizing the projected long short term memory models. These models are designed to analyze complete blood counts that are more effectively counting for both temporal and demographic complexities of patients. So the data set used in this work or in this study was obtained from uh, a center or a, di a diagnostic center in India and encompasses complete blood count data from 364 adult patients. This data set is publicly available under open access license, and we directly adopt it for this work. To maintain data consistency and reliability, the study specifically excludes children, pregnant women, and individuals under 15 years of age. This deliberate focus ensures that the analysis is concentrated on, uh, on a well-defined population. The data set compromise uh, 11 K and attributes, including critical hemoglobin, hemo, hematological parameters such as hemoglobin and red blood cells and mean cell volume and so on. These parameters are essential for uh, diagnosing various types and severities of anemia as classified by the World Wide Health Organization. Additionally, the demographic distribution of the patient provides valuable insights into anemia trends across different age groups and genders, enabling a more comprehensive understanding of how these factors influence anemia relevance and its clinical applications. This rich data set serves as a robust foundation for developing and validating the projected long-term memory model. 
ultimately contributing to more accurate and effective diagnosis practices. So, reprocessing the data set is a crucial step in analytical pipeline as it directly influences. Hello. The yes. Eric. Yes, please. Hello. Hello. Yes. Hello, sir. Yes, okay. Continue, please. Okay. Hello. So, due to time constraints, I will move to the next uh, slide. The core of this study involves the use of projected long short term memory network and advanced variant of traditional long short term memory model, which is DLSTM. DLSTM introduced the projection layer that reduces the dimensionality of the hidden states, making the model more computationally efficient without sacrificing predictive performance. K hyperparameters such as learning rate, batch size, and projection size were fine tuned using Bayesian optimization, a sophisticated technique that helps to identify the most optimal configuration to maximize model accuracy. The primary objective function used in this study is the coefficient of determination, known as R squared, which measures how well the model explains the variability in data. So the R squared or the coefficient of determination is a statistical measure that indicates the proportion of variance in the dependent variable that is predictable from independent variables. In simpler terms, it shows how well the model fits data. An R squared value of one indicates perfect fit and an R squared of zero suggests that the model fails to explain much variability in the data. So a central focus of this research is direct comparison between the, proje the proposed projected long short term memory and the traditional long short term memory models. While the LSTM model has proven to be effective in many scenarios, the PLSTM consistently outperforms it, particularly in terms of coefficient of determination and its ability to generalize to, to new data. This enhanced generalization means that the projected long short term memory is significantly less prone to overfitting, a common issue with long short term memory model, especially when handling large and complex data sets. The introduction of a projection layer in PLSTM is a key innovation, allowing for the model to train more efficiently with reduced computational requirements. This efficiency makes the PLSTM not only more accurate, but also faster, with a crucial for which is crucial for real-time diagnostic application where quick and reliable predictions are essential for patient care. So, the results of training phase reveal that both long short term memory and PLSTM modes perform well with low root mean squared error and mean absolute error values, indicating strong predictive capabilities. However, the long short term memory mode show that signs of overfitting evidenced by high R squared values during training. This suggests that while the long short term memory fits the training data exceptionally well, it becomes overly specialized to the training set reducing its ability to generalize to new and seen samples, a key concern in medical diagnostics. In contrast, the proposed version of LSTM model demonstrates a more balanced performance fitting the training data effectively without overfitting. This balance is critical or this balance is critical for maintaining predictive accuracy when the model is applied to new cases, ensuring that it, is, it remains reliable across different data sets and conditions. So in the testing phase, results clearly demonstrate the superior performance of the long short term memory or the proposed long short term memory compared to the traditional one when applied to unseen data. The projected long short term memory consistently achieved lower error rate as measured by the root mean squared error and mean absolute error alongside with higher R squared values indicating a strong ability to generalize to new and trained samples. So, one of the most notable advantages of the projected LSTM is its exceptional computational efficiency, which becomes especially important when processing large data sets common in medical diagnostics. 
in our study, the training time for PLSTM was significantly faster than traditional LSTM model. This efficiency is achieved by utilized fewer training epochs and smaller batch size, allowing the projected LSTM to handle data intensive tasks with reduced computational overhead. This makes it particularly well, well suited for real time applications where speed is critical, such as in clinical settings where rapid diagnosis for anemia is essential. Despite its lower resource demands, projected long short term memory maintain high predictive accuracy and robust performance, understanding the benefits of its architecture in managing complex multi dimensional medical data. So, as a conclusion, our conclusion from this study emphasized that the projected long short term memory superior performance in generalization, predictive accuracy, and computational efficiency compared to traditional methods. By leveraging the long short term memory or the projected version of it, the diagnostic process for anemia can be significantly enhanced, offering a more accurate predictions and ultimately improving patient outcomes. Furthermore, finding of this study suggests that the long short term memory has the potential to be adapted for use in other medical diagnostic tasks, paving the way for future research into broader application in healthcare. This opens a new avenues for utilizing machine learning to advance precision in medicine and streamline diagnostic procedure across various conditions. And uh, thank you very much for your listening. Okay. Thank you for the presentation. Okay, thank you so much. Have you some questions? I think. Some questions? Thank you, Tarek. Thank you for, for your presentation. Okay, thank you so much for the great conference and uh, everyone uh, who contributed in its success. Doctor Ernesto López. Hello. The, Sorry. The next, the next, the next talk was moved to another session because of uh, time uh, in the country from Pakistan. Yeah. Yes. 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 So, I know. Uh, okay. So uh, we still. We, still and we, and authors from the third paper are already here. No, no, yes. doctor. No. Este, me mandé el portugués. Mm -hmm. Hacerse dos la presentación. Hello. Hello. Hello, doctor. Hello. I'm very sorry for this delay. I have some problems with Teams. And, uh, yeah, so I, 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 I take another computer from my daughter. So we, we can. Uh, Wait for the, the schedule to for the paper no, number one hundred thirty, or we can continue. You, you, all the speakers are uh, in the session. Yes, they are already here. They are. Uh... 
Uh, about the time is four. Yes, yes, please. And I think it's very great. You will wait a little bit, Dr. Mayer, uh, just to start at uh, four ten. Because no, there are some other authors over there who will be will come to present other papers. Sorry, I, 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 I can listen uh, very well. Well, uh, uh, the, the next talk will be given at uh, 410 by Professor Matias Alvarado. He's already okay. here. And he asked that uh, to, to work with the, the original uh, schedule. Okay. okay, is that okay? Okay, okay. Okay, okay thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, okay. Sí, sí, creo que sería bueno, ¿no? Los cuatro sí, días, ¿no? Sí, mejor ah, esperar. No sé si haya más asesinatos.
Doctor Ernesto, we are ready. Sorry, sorry. Okay. Yes, we are ready, Doctor. Yes, uh, Matias Alvarado is going to present the, the paper, the next paper, Emotion Regulation in Breast Cancer Patients. So uh, you have a uh, 15 minutes. I will advertise uh, one minute before uh, you the time finish. So uh, go ahead, please. You can open your uh, camera, turn on your camera. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Yes. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you so much for staying here. Uh, we present a uh, motion regulation in breast cancer patients. Initial study with re regression models. My partners is uh, Nasira Maya Tejera and Eduardo Zurek. They are from Universidad del Norte in Barranquilla, Colombia. Uh, and okay. This is okay. This is the table of contents. Introduction, background, material and methods, results, discussion or conclusions, and the list of reference. Okay, we start. Uh, the emotions in breast cancer patients health. It's a uh, very well known that psychological factors impact health in breast cancer patients, and that uh, the emotion regulations impacts the uh, health recovery. This is a well accepted statement that by persons actually okay, but all, always they are skeptical. Uh, so these people said, give me numbers please, but data because perhaps I don't know. Okay. Uh, and yes, uh, people that know that have analyzed Except that positive emotions work a lot. Particularly, if we use emotion regulation, that's treatment adherence. Because the people is positive about uh, hair uh, and said hair because mostly is a, a cancer in human people, and said yes, and emotion regulation, that means a positive emotion handling, improves treatment and the quality of the life. And, okay, for skeptical people and for confident people that, that wish uh, numbers, we quantify impact of emotional regulation in breast cancer patients by applying machine learning methods for predictions for identifying the machine learning attributes that works out. So the method we use is, of course, read and reprocessing data of uh, sample data of breast cancer patients, train and predict doing uh, chain iteration this time with one linear method, linear regression, that is not right in here, but we do, we did, and random forest regression and support vector machine regressions. And the result is uh, after uh, one uh, statistical analysis. Uh, and the performance is using these uh, metrics. Okay, uh, the, the standard questionnaire that we use for doing uh, is one uh, questionnaire that arose in 1993. That is uh, the uh, European, and something said here, I don't remember, but is the questionnaire life quality uh, C30 because there are uh, 30 questions in multiple health domains. Uh, this is for the authors that use uh, this uh, tool in a successful model. And uh, the scoring scale is uh, from 1 to 100 usual to assess uh, symptoms like fatigue and pain. And we choose physical health and well being as well. But most, most important for us, emotional and social functions. 
Uh, then let us reduce the uh, beyond the linear regression that is not included here. Sorry for the dissolution. Is the random forest regression? Random forest. Uh, this is a set of trees uh, for doing decisions uh, because it's well known that multiple trees, uh, trees used for improved results. Each tree is chained with, with random sample data and the average predictions from all the trees is the prediction that uh, given by the whole forest of uh, this. Uh, and the next one, ah, ah, okay, yes. Ah, no, no, the next one is, no, ah, yes. And the other method we used is the support vector regression. And this is a powerful tool for doing classifications, of course, but, but also regression. And classification is usually for categorical uh, attributes and regression is also for quantities that uh, will be uh, uh, continuously key. Uh, and this uh, method to transformation from data into a higher dimensional space for working with more efficiency, efficacy, or uh, uh, jump the linear separability problem uh, as in the illustration, you can see that we be very complex linearly separate the red from the green data. And with this kind of method, it's simple, it's, it's, it is kernel functions, linear polynomial of the other one I show next. The data set is uh, from artwork done from Carbona Jonas in 2021. Uh, this uh, make a traditional data analysis can be made using, of course, these QAQ C30 scores uh, that emphasizes the cognitive, the social functioning, and more important, the emotional function. Also includes uh, demographic and medical information. And we use this data with machine learning uh, methods, the methods I mentioned before. This is the, the, the kind of data that is included there, of course, demographic and medical, as you can see there. Uh, uh, but more important for us is these uh, roles, the ARF2 role functions, that it means the roles that each people do in her uh, daily life. If they are teachers, employers, uh, staff, administrative, um, and so on. Um, the cognitive functioning, the social functioning, and also the others' attributes, okay? Uh, this is the, the metrics usually use in the usual way, the, the quadratic differences, the summation, and so on. And uh, the future importance here is a, 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 with a special attention, if, if a emotional functioning, physical functioning, social functioning, and the um, role functioning. This is very important for us. Please pay attention to the initials. Uh, yes, the higher parameters of each model, in this case for the random forest, is uh, 100 trees we used. The maximal depth of any tree is 10 leaves levels of, of, of peaks and for support vector regression is the, the radial basis functions that is the function we use for data transformation and the flexibility for detecting errors is C. If one is no strict now, uh, but okay, works now. You can see that with linear regression, this is the results. EF is the emotional functioning and QL2 the quality of life. <clears throat> you can see that uh, that uh, green, uh, the tiger is the emotional functioning uh, presence. Uh, the quality of life uh, also is higher, as you can see in the superior right corner in this score. And here, the future importance of the attributes using support vector method. Vector, uh, vector machine, sorry, 
And you can see here that the functional uh, attributes is in the second place. The role functioning is the highest, very, very high in, in this uh, scale. And the emotional functioning is in the, in this case, in the fifth uh, place. This is the media and this is the standard deviation. Okay. So this is, this is uh, one. The, the method settles that these attributes, they are important also for the random forest method. The role functioning is in the second place with this media and with this standard deviation. The social functioning is also important in the fifth place with this media and standard regression and standard deviation, sorry. And the emotional functioning in the sixth place, with this media and standard deviation. So, Conclusions, uh, this is the, the initial means, the metrics. This is the results. Um, both models show similar uh, L2 valuations. Yes, the others also, yes. Uh, and it means that emotional regulation positive, positively impacts the patients, the breast cancer patients' health. So, uh, this is the conclusions. Of course, positive emotions works, work a lot. Uh, good emotion uh, effectively uh, does treatment adherence, improves uh, the treatment uh, and the quality of life. And we quantify the impact of emotional regulation in breast cancer patients by applying these methods. And of course, uh, we need a broad this uh, research with more data on additional emotional regulations and with more uh, features that we can study previous or posterior to interrogations and evaluations. So I don't know what's uh, okay. And uh, this is the positive emotion goes a lot. Uh, thanks so much. And um, I don't know if there is some questions yes. okay thank you matthias uh, we have a uh, some questions in the in the room the people that who are attending uh, on site no are there negative emotions? <laughs> yes, of course. Actually, uh, the, the negative emotions have been analyzed previously, and there are more quantified or estimations on the impact of emo negative emotions, sadness, depressions, uh, and so on. And the impact negative uh, that has in the evolution of the, the cancer but no quantitative studies, and actually no qualitative uh, studies about the impact of positive emotion regulation. Uh, perhaps we are the, the first that we are doing in this systematic way using machine learning methods. You know, yes, of course, they are, and they impact negative they uh, put the patients, the breast cancer patients, in a worse way. Uh, positive emotion is helpful, but of course it depends also of the a companion has the patient. If the patient has company, people that is worse uh, and suffering, let's say, with her, it helps the patients. In some way, it could be related to placebo effect because related to what? Placebo effect. Uh, when some people, there is an effect placebo and placebo effect. Uh, when people uh -huh. tend to believe in the medication and the treatment, and also the other way around. Uh, any people can. Think about about this, of course, 
but uh, when the medical, when the people suffering the sick has this positive ambience, she goes to medical through analysis and is frequent that that the, her state of health is better. So perhaps it's one placebo effect, but uh, perhaps it means that this is the effect of positive handling of emotions. Well, I mean, uh, not, not maybe similar, I mean, uh, uh, external emotions are important, I can see that. So, but uh, in this placebo and nocebo is internal emotion, right? So yes, of course. Yes, but I, I mean, it's very similar. It seems to be very similar. Yes, 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 of course. Uh, convictions and the handling of emotions is uh, quite studied that impacts the recovery of the people almost with circumstances. Mm -hmm. And now we using. Uh, data with the previous analysis of Carmona and Mayonas, which show similar results that they show. And actually, we are extended this research with other methods and uh, with synthetic uh, data, and the pattern is similar. So, but we are starting. We need more samples, but now the results they are uh, quite similar. That the people that study the phenomenon in Spain, in Colombia, in Mexico, and in other countries said in a traditional analysis, and then also using natural methods, the results they are it's consistent. Yeah. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. So, we have the time for more questions. Uh, indeed, uh, we have uh, eight minutes. <laughs> ah, okay, okay. If you have more questions, <laughs> I I am very happy. I was I was wondering about the the role functions. How is this? I mean, the deployment, the attitude. How does this? Uh, How do I measure that? Yes, uh, affect the, the positive emotion. Because the the word function is the the function the the person does in her daily life. As instance, it is a teacher, and the teacher is uh, can to her activity, her teaching, the uh, person is, is, is happy for any people. And if she can uh, attend uh, her sons, her daughters, the person is, is happy. And this is also one characteristic that, that positive uh, feedback to positive feedback in the attitude and in the recovery of, of the person. If the person not uh, does a uh, her activity, uh, usually this a person tends to be sad, to be depressive, uh, and less activity uh, she is able to to do. So this is the positive feedback that has the positive attitude. So responsibilities and stress. How can you, you represent the numbers uh, to write the algorithms? Yes. Yes. Not the yes. interpretation of numbers. So. Responsabil uh, responsibilities in job or stress. Uh, yes, uh, usually uh, because the stress in excess has been quantified at least 
bad in the case of the people. But in the healthy uh, quantity, let's say, the healthy housing of the stress for stay active, it's, it's positive. Perhaps it's, it's the terrible for the people. Do you remember to Professor Adrian Maluca with the stress? Yes. <laughs> Yes, uh, actually, uh, previous when, when our mate questions about the placebo effect, Adriano uh, suffered, suffered uh, um, cancer of kidney, in kidney. And uh, he, uh, I mean, 15 years ago, treats also the psychological uh, part. And also used alternative methods. But when he went to Cancerology Hospital in the south of Mexico City, the physicians were wondered about the evolution of the health of Adriana, being him 70. And I remember he said me that I did not explain them my treatment. My, my, the, the reason, the deep reason why I am fine, surprising for them. They said, this is what we like. Science, medical science, standard medical science, cannot explain. But Adriano said, of course, standard medical science, no. But broad medical science, psychological attention to the problem, explains. So uh, now we learned since 15 years ago at least uh, that the emotional uh, attention to the problem is one point important. Um, uh, and each day this is more abnormal. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Matias. Uh, it's amazing. Thank you. So, uh, next speaker is, I think, uh, Carlos Minuti. And in two minutes, uh, he will start the presentation. Okay. I'm Jimmy Swap. Yeah, it's okay. No. Can you turn on your uh, camera? Please. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I start. Two minutes. <laughs> okay, we can start now. So, uh, Carlos, go ahead. Thanks. So, today I'm, uh, I'm presenting. This research work is on reveling the complex interplay between socioeconomic status, air pollution, and heart disease, disease hospitalization in the urban population. So, about this work, uh, this is uh, here I am studying the relationship between heart disease hospitalization, socioeconomic status, and air pollution, and what is the impact on healthcare outcomes in Mexico City. Uh, th this this kind of research is already well known in the field. Many people are studying the impact of socioeconomic status, also air pollution, but usually they tend to do it uh, in a individual way, including uh, socioeconomic status or only air pollution. And when they are studying socioeconomic status, they are so including a very simple uh, metric like outcome or maybe education. So the, the also there is research uh, uh, find, finding that air pollution as 
social economy status is correlated. So th that says they should be studied together because one uh, one could be a confounder factor of the other one. And that's a problem because if we only include, for example, cells, the effect can, can be overestimated because we are not included in pollution. So in this work, we are included bone, air pollution and cells. Also, we are doing a simultaneous analysis on multiple risk factors, and we are uh, uh, trying to do uh, a distinction between so economic and social sense components in order to try to uh, distinguish which one is the most important in which this is. And also we are including multiple air pollutants in our study. Usually um, in many studies only include particle matters. We're including, on, include only the, uh, we include all pollutants reported by the Mexico City. So, uh, cardiovascular disease impact, well, in globally is a leading cause of uh, global mortality. 17.9 million lives annually is the, the cost of this disease, this kind of disease. Um, the primary types is coronary heart disease, cerebrovascular disease, rheumatic heart disease, and the risk factors is diet, inactivity, tobacco, alcohol, the environment, air pollution, for example, particle matter, household air pollution, and for, of course, socioeconomic factors. Uh, what about Mexico? Well, in Mexico, uh, this is a sign mortality increase uh, since uh, 1980 to 2010, 48%. There are gender difference in this rising, uh, rising rates in men is 33% and 22% increase in women. And it's also an economic burden, uh, costing 96.4 billion pesos in 2015. Uh, also, in healthcare context, this is 4% of total health expenditure. And conducts across developed nations and growing public health concerns. Our primary goal is to analyze the relationship uh, in terms of status, air pollution, and health disease hospitalizations. Uh, focus in three dis disease categories, hypertensive disease, ischemic heart disease, and pulmonary circulation disease. Uh, the innovation in this study is with, uh, we separate economic and social access components, and we have an integrator, integrated the entire pollution data, and we focus on severity weight outcomes. About the methodology, we have uh, around nine, uh, 11,000 anonymized records from CEDESA, the, the, uh, the Ministry of Health in Mexico City from 2015 to 2020. Uh, some package demographics, or, uh, official hospital states uh, details, and ICD codes for indices. Uh, we also have for the environmental data 15 years of air quality average, multiple pollutants, PM, CO, NO and spatial interpolation to this uh, concentrations in all Mexico City. For socioeconomic data, we have the 2020 uh, Mexico census, and we are constructed a uh, composite index with this data using housing and uh, population variables and local uh, locality level information. So uh, for modeling, we are using uh, to model the number of hospitalization, negative binomial regression, using, using monthly hospitalization by locality. Our input variables, some of them are demographics, uh, sex indicators, uh, air pollution, and we also have an indicator variable uh, about COVID-19 lockdown, because during COVID, uh, the number of hospitalizations uh, increase in all the, almost all uh, the Disease. So we're including this as a uh, variable in order to compensate for that and not be able to include 2020 in the results. We also st study uh, nonlinear effects using gradient boosting, and, and also with that we were able to study var variable interactions. So this is the number of cases for the the, the overall category of heart disease. We have. Nine, uh, 11,000 records for hypertensive disease 
5,000, pulmonary circulation 3,000, and ischemic heart disease almost 3,000. We are waiting our uh, each uh, record by severity. I, I'm going to present in a, a few minutes uh, what severity in this case. We uh, we can have multiple categories. Uh, in, for example, some per people have, can be uh, ownership to more to one category, and we have a category specific risk factors. So this is severity is like a zero one variable. When one is the disease and zero is the recover, but this weighted. Uh, if the patient uh, have a death, but in very little time, it's almost close to one. If the patient recover in uh, also in very little time, uh, it is almost close to zero. So with this uh, variable y, uh, we are uh, giving weights to each records in order to to be able to predict more, the more severe uh, cases, the numbers of cases. So why, why many people don't include so many variables in, in this kind of models? The, the answer is multicoronality. Multicoronality is a problem because if we include multiple variables in our study, it's difficult to, to interpret because, for example, very correlated variables. Here we have a, an extreme example. Uh, this is our real model. This is the only one variable, x1. And this is the real value. But if we include another variable, which is the same, exactly the same, but we don't know that. Well, the model can change a lot, and the coefficient can even have a a contradictive results. For example, here, our region was positive, here is negative, the relationship with the variables. And it also, it can be very tricky to, to do sensitivity analysis because these coefficients can be very large because of multiplicity. If we mop one of these variables, the result in the in the independent variable is going to be large. So usually it's very difficult to, to be careful with multicarity. In this case, we are uh, grouping the uh, socioeconomic status variables and also the, the, the very correlated pollutants in order to avoid these kind of problems. And we also uh, develop a, a selection variable algorithm, which is penalizing the variables that are to move to, that are very correlated between them. So this results in a model with very on, with few variables and they are they are not too correlated. That simplifies the interpretation of the model. So an example of this, uh, this is uh, the pollutants concentration in this 15 years uh, study in Mexico City. As you can see, this is a PC principal component analysis. And uh, as PM and CO are correlated, especially with concentration in Mexico City, also NO and SO. So this can be a problem because in West all, all together, we are going, maybe we are estimating the relationship with one of the variables, but it actually gives results of another one because of this relationship. So we are grouping these variables with these high correlated variables. So we have these groups, PM, CO, with these two variables, and O and CO and O and O3. These three, three groups of uh, contaminants is the main uh, factors here for, for air pollution. And we are doing something similar for, uh, for socioeconomic status. We're trying to, uh, to have a factor, economic factor and a social factors. We do factor analysis in order to achieve this. You can see th these two factors are highly correlated, but not too much. And in the first factor, for example, we, we have variables usually related with poverty. And in the second one, we have variables like the average years of schooling. So this one is the social factor, F2, and F1 is the economic factor. So for now, F1 is F economic and F social, F2 is F social. And high values of these variables mean less favorable circumstance. And we did some validation again uh, against uh, established indices like social gap index, social development index, and the human development index. And in all of them, we have a, a, a coefficient of regression uh, greater than 0.9. So that, that says that we can reproduce those coefficients for these two factors. But also, we found, found that each factor is statistically significant. So 
each factor uh, has some data is not uh, saying the same thing. Yeah, each factor contributes contributes uh, independently. So about some results here we we can find a very simple result. This is our correlation. Why is the number of, of cases of hospitalization? And the most obvious uh, variable related with this one is the total population of the locality. This is most correlated. And here we can find that the social variable is also important, but this variable could be also a proxy for other variables, for example, for contamination, for air pollution. So it is not sufficient to use only correlation. We are using uh, the regression models. And this is the final result of the iterative model. Uh, this is the, 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 all these variables are statistical significant. The most important one in, uh, increasing the number of hospitalization is the total population. But also you can see the economic factor has a, a importance in this model. Uh, also, we can see that the COVID lo lockdown reduces the number of cases of cases and the pollutants, the specifically PM and CO, increasing also the number of hospitalizations by locality. Uh, when hypertensive disease is uh, also, again, total prevention is the most important variable, but in this case, social factor is almost half of the effect of the total population. So it's very, a very important factor here in order to predict the number of hospitalizations. And also, we have a reduced number of hospitalization due to the COVID lockdown. Uh, for a uh, disease of pulmonary circulation, we have again the most important uh, variable is total population. After that, this uh, population from 15 to 80 years old, 84 years old. And almost as important as that one is the social factor. So you can see here the social factor is playing a very important role in predicting the number of hospitalization, uh, COVID lockdown uh, again. And for ischemic heart disease is the total population again. Uh, and we can find uh, that pollutants like PM and CO is having a, a, a significant role here. And also the relation, uh, the, the rate of male per same females. So uh, about these results, you can see that we modeled uh, in, as in many studies, studies says, but we found that both cess and air pollution have an impact in the number of hospitalization. And in some cases, we found that uh, is the social, in the, at least in this uh, kind of disease, is the social factor very important, more than the economical factor in the number of hospitalizations. Uh, uh, we don't have enough time for to present gradient boosting results, but usually the relationship between them are, are related to weight and, uh, and age or the, the concentration of many pollutants in the area. So the key find, find this is this, this is strong relation with the, the contaminants. And uh, okay, here, here the nonlinear effects I already mentioned. Our conclusion is our key findings is components have distinct impacts, our pollution significant for a specific condition, and this is a complex variable interaction between them. Uh, this implication need to, we need to target intervention, consider both of these factors. Environment, environmental policy improvements are also focused on economic disparities. What are the limitations? Well, we only have hospitalization data that can be a bias because, for example, for people with a very low sex, maybe they don't, can afford to be hospitalized. And thus, so that can be a bias. Uh, also, uh, we could be, have a potential national co-founders. So in the future, we plan to add, add some predictors like comorbidities and also study the relationship with other diseases. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Now we, we have uh, time for questions. Sorry, I, I lost a bit the 
the method you used for analysis of this station. Yes. Now, we are using, uh, we're trying to predict the number of hospitalization by locality and months in, in five years. And we are using a uh, negative binomial regression. Okay. So using the number of non hospitalization by locality. And, and input variables are some demographics and size indicators, these indicators, and pollution, for example. After you mentioned by the municip municipes in the Mexico City, mm -hmm. some data, but I'm not, uh, I don't identify the order of uh, the best to the worst for each. Like this one? Uh, for municipes, it were Miguel Hidalgo, Mito Juárez, yeah. Estapalapa, Tlago, you mentioned several of them. But I not see the order in each of the health of the diseases you mentioned. Yeah, here we have, for example, a, a red color means that this uh, increased the, the number of hospitalization. It's a factor or, or a variable that increased. Uh, the blue one decreased the number of hospitalization. This is actually the coefficient of regression. So here we have the negative coefficients and the positive coefficients, and. Because, uh, we, uh, as you, you said, we have some uh, municipalities in the Mexico City area. For example, we have Iztapalapa. Okay. That means that Iztapalapa have, for some reason, have a, a lower number of hospitalization by heart disease that expected. It could be by, by many reasons. For example, they have a, 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 a but few hospitals. It, it could be. It could be anything, for example, because the hospitals, they are, they are private or public. It's public. It's public. It's public. It's public. Yes. Yeah, but it, that can also can be a factor because yes. uh, because of that, we are included the municipalities in order to know if some municipality is having a different effect on the inspector and also to avoid that, that affect the model. But yeah, it can be also interesting to to know why this municipality have a different effect. For example, for uh, Pajimalpa Morelos have an increased number than expected in this disease. Uh, in this case also, again, Iztapalapa for hypertensive disease have a lower number than expected. Gustavo Madero the same. And only um, uh, Miguel Hidalgo, uh, Benito Juarez have an increased number of expected cases. Okay, one more question. No? Talking about the, the locality, because most of the hospitals here in Mexico City, many need to come from different states. So, how can you correlate? Uh, the people in the hospital are not from Mexico City. Yeah, uh, actually, in the data, we have that kind of information and many people come from the uh, state of Mexico. So we only use patients coming from uh, Mexico City. Yeah, but actually it could be also a different analysis to do that for patients coming from the state of Mexico. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much, Carlos Minuti. Okay. Okay, uh, now we have uh, the next uh, presentation. The speaker, I think, is uh, Nasser. Maybe I'm wrong. No? Yeah, I'm in here. Okay, can you show your presentation? Uh, you are in, the, in Mexico City. That's right, yes. I'm in person. Okay. Not certainly. Okay. No. But uh, the presentation is not, not showing teams. Yes. 
the phone call for 20, I believe. 20 is the first one, yeah. Okay. Okay. Can you show uh, the presentation in? 40 is the yeah. first, sorry, 40 is the first one, 20. Good for us. Can you show the presentation, please? We, we are, uh, okay. Nice. It's the right one. So, no, uh, the 40, yeah, 40, it's a 40, 40 is the right. The field deployment. 40? No, no, 40. Yes. Field deployment okay. of personalized. Okay, can you open is, the. Is this? Yes, that's right. Okay, can, can you uh, uh, can you put the presentation in the in the mode of presentation? To have a, a, a wider a wider presentation of the slides. Okay. Can you see it? Yes. That, you uh, uh, open uh, open uh, what you say the yes yes you can you change the model uh, the model in, in the presentation Okay. okay, you can start. Okay, now go ahead. All right, thank you. Uh, hello, good afternoon. My name is Nasser Ketanabas. I'll be uh, talking about uh, this project, which is a chapter of what one of my PhD student dissertation, also me. Um, okay, let's. All right. Okay, now. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is what you see here is a typical hearing aid prescription. Uh, this prescription is uh, called DSLV5. It's very popular. Basically, what it is, is a bunch of gains in different frequency bands for different levels of a speech, soft, moderate, and loud. So what you see here is an actual prescription. Uh, basically, how much gain this particular person needs in different frequency bands. And uh, this, basically, the way this is put together is based on audiograph, the lowest level of sound a person can hear in different frequency bands. What we've been wanting to do is taking this prescription and personalizing it. Um, why? Because half of the people who are prescribed this prescription are not happy with their prescription. Uh, this is because this prescription and similar prescriptions are put together based on averages of population with similar hearing loss. They haven't been personalized to a specific person and to different sound environments. That's why people that get fitted with a, a standard prescription are not, half of them at least, not happy. It has been well established that if you take the uh, standard prescription and personalize it, we achieve better outcome. What you see here, the lower curve is the lowest level of sound uh, a person can hear. The upper curve is the maximum level of comfort level. And the red curve is a standard setting. 
gains in different frequency bands. You can view this frequency band gains. Now, what we want to do is adjust the red curve in a personalized manner to achieve better hearing for that individual. Such a personalization, there are commercial products, uh, they display two of them here, but the way they do the personalization in this commercial product is by manual adjustment. using machine learning techniques to personalize amplification gains uh, for a specific user in different audio settings. We've gone through three generations of personalization. Our first generation solution uh, uh, used deep reinforcement learning, and it was effective, but the training had to be done offline. It wasn't field deployed. The second generation, we use maximum likelihood uh, inverse reinforcement learning, and we made the training online. So it can be done in an online manner by doing paired comparison. Is audio one better than audio two, or audio two is better than audio one? But the problem with the second generation, it took a long time. Uh, a couple of hours, that's a long time for a user to make adjustments. So we've come up with this uh, third generation solution uh, based on a Bayesian machine learning. And so this work is about taking this third generation machine learning and then making an app out of it so that the adjustment can be done in real world audio environments uh, in a sort of field deployable manner. Let me give a brief overview of this third generation solution. We define a bunch of hearing preference function in different frequency band channels. Then we estimate these uh, functions using Bayesian machine learning. So once we have uh, the, uh, this hearing preference function, the amplification function uh, curve is the one that gives us the highest preference function in each band. What are the advantages of this third generation personalization approach? We can do it quite fast. Within five minutes, we can uh, do the training testing. Uh, this is for, for just doing 28 paired comparisons uh, for eight level adjustments. Paired comparison is very much like fitting uh, eyeglasses. Do you see better with lens one, lens two? Do you hear better audio one, audio two? So very easy for users to do. It's not something that they need to think a lot about it. And also it's a scalable to different frequency bands. Different hearing aids use different number of channels, 9, 16, 11, 22. So doesn't matter the number of channels. Uh, this uh, the same amount of training time would be needed. The idea is quite simple. Basically, we have this Bayesian framework. The user feedback is built uh, into this probability. This is the prior probability. And then we estimate, we find F in such a way that the posterior probability is maximized. Of course, there are parameters that are associated with these models and those parameters need to be estimated. We do this in a two-step process. We use Laplacian approximation to get an estimate for F, next F, and then we fix F and then estimate the parameters. And we go through this iterative process until uh, we get convergence. So we did a subject uh, study using this personalized third generation personalization. And we need to do, of course, uh, uh, in the US, uh, I IRB approval is needed to do any type of subject uh, testing. We got subject testing uh, approved. Uh, and uh, we did this first in a sound booth. We uh, trained 
the system using 28 comparison and then tested uh, the system between compare the uh, personalization, uh, personalized amplification to a standard amplification. Everything was done in a noise setting, babble type of noise. People have difficulty communicating at 5 dB signal to noise ratio. And what you see in this table is basically the difference between the standard gains in five frequency bands. These are all in dBs and the personalized gains. So do you see a difference between a standard prescription and personalized uh, gain values? And this curve is illustrating uh, the, the preference testing that we did. Um, the, bar, uh, the blue bars correspond to personalized setting with, it, with what percentage of time personalized setting was preferred and then red bars to what percentage of time the standard setting was preferred and green to the same, no preference between the two settings. And as you can see in all this, uh, the, uh, for all the subjects, personalized setting was preferred over, of course, with different degrees, depending on the degree, amount of hearing loss, uh, personalized setting was preferred over um, a standard setting. Now, uh, so this uh, personalization, we wanted to make an app out of it. And uh, we incorporated this within uh, iOS and Android uh, uh, shells, Android Java shells and Objective-C shells. Uh, we needed to bring the frequency uh, sampling down. If you want to have the lowest uh, 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 latency on a smartphone, it has to be done at 48 kilohertz. That's the way a smartphone IO or uh, analog to digital converters are uh, designed. But if you want to operate at 48 kilohertz, we run out of time. We cannot achieve real time. So we bring the sampling rate down. We, we capture at that 48 uh, kilohertz sampling rate to have the lowest latency and then do all the signal processing at 16 kilohertz so that we would be able to uh, process 10 millisecond frame in uh, less than two milliseconds for Android, uh, less than two milliseconds for uh, iPhone 1.3 milliseconds. So this is basically illustrating the signal processing pipeline that would allow this third generation personalization to run on a platform on the ARM engine of uh, smartphones. This is the smartphone app attributes. Uh, as you can see, the, the 10 millisecond frames get processed in less than one millisecond. So no frames is, is escaped. We, process, we can process frames in uh, uh, real time. iPhones, they have a better latency than Android phones, uh, nine millisecond on iPhone, 60 uh, milliseconds or so. Uh, on Android phone. The, uh, in terms of CPU utilization, it doesn't create that much burden on CPU and also memory, the amount of memory is reasonable compared to many other apps that you download uh, from Apple Store or uh, Google Play. Here is the app GUI, the training part, the uh, testing, the training part, we go through this gain A, gain B, paired comparison 28 times. The, the user can do this on uh, his or her own, doesn't need somebody to do this in a, a sound booth setting. This can be done in a sort of, in a crowded room by the user. And then once the, this uh, personalized setting is set, then the user can uh, see whether, uh, personalized setting is preferred over the original prescription set. We did this also in the field, you know, with uh, six subjects. Uh, you see that the standard gains, again, are different than personalized gains. 
And these are the hearing preference that was done using the app, not in the sound booth, but using the app. You can see that again, across all six, uh, six uh, subjects, they prefer the personalized setting over the what they are normally prescribed by an audiologist, uh, which is the uh, orange curve. Let's play this uh, uh, video. I think for you, you should be able to see it. This is setting with gains in different frequency bands. Uh, this is like the audiogram. The, the, the very, that's the information needed. The uh, point between two things settings. No, no, you have some questions. Can they hear it? Can they hear it? Okay, the training is now done. Now the testing, so between the personalized setting and uh, the standard setting. Okay. I don't think they can hear. In teams, you need to turn on audio. It's open Okay. There are some more questions. We have two well, minutes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, go I'm going to one more slide, a conclusion. I was playing a video here. Um, so basically what we've done in this, uh, in this work, we've taken our third generation personalization solution, which is a Bayesian machine learning, and made an app out of it. Why we've done it? Because we want the user basically to make the adjustment uh, in the field, uh, in a real world audio setting. And it's designed in such a way that it can be done fairly quickly, not like our second generation, which was too slow. And the subject testing we've done We've shown that, that uh, we've shown that on average, the personalized setting is six times better than, or preferred, I should say, compared to a standard setting. That's it. We'll be glad to answer any, any questions. You planning to use this feedback? Uh, well, I, I don't know. I do want to have uh, feedback from the app. And um, are you going to use it for maybe a an, an next generation version of this model? Yeah, data mining can be done. So suppose if users basically decide their own personalized it. It can get uploaded this their setting with their audiogram to a, say, uh, to a central site. And then data mining can be done to come up with a new prescription. Uh, but the, the feedback is already in core, individual feedback is already incorporated into the Bayesian uh, framework because that the, the probability that they decide what path to take or what each of the two options to select is already part of that uh, framework. So individual 
uh, feedback is there. If you want to look at everybody's feedback, then we need access to everyone's data to do some data mining to come up with a new prescription. This, by the way, this can be applied to any prescription. It's not just the DSLV5. There are two widely used hearing aid prescription, NL2 and DSLV5. These are 80-90% of audiologists, I mean, <laughs> audiologists 80-90% of the time they use this setting, uh, NL2 or uh, DSLV5. It can also be applied to NL2 because we start our starting point is the standard prescription. That's the initial condition. And then we take that the standard initial condition curve and personalize it for a particular person for a particular sound setting. Um, another question there. The US back to have a maybe different results for demographics, for example, maybe uh, this already bi biasian solution maybe is not uh, as good as it is uh, in another country, for example. Yeah, I mean, the, the basically a personalization, that's why we are saying personalization. For that specific person, we are personalizing the setting. So that person, I mean, the difference between female and male, the difference between age, this all can play a role here. People get older, they're hearing high frequency is going to drop out. So, but it doesn't matter. As long as you see the, uh, the audiologist set a prescription for that person. Now we can, we can take that person prescription and make fine tune that prescription. Yeah by using this personalization scheme. Can I follow? <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I have a question. Uh, I was thinking in the in uh, normal headphones, because uh, with the anti noise control, uh, is, this, is, is it possible to connect the, this uh, Tuning this deployment for personal related yeah. difficulties? Good question. Yes, this is applicable to personal sound amplifier, is applicable to cochlear implant. They all use the same approach. You have gains in different frequency bands. Personal sound amplifier operate basically based on the same principle. How do we, um, somebody prefers more gain in high frequency? Somebody prefers more gain in low frequency? Yes, the answer is yes. The same framework can be applied, not necessarily to hearing aid amplification, to personal sound amplifier. Cochlear implant yeah. use the same sort of thing. They have a bunch of uh, frequency channel, and then a curve is used, which is set basically how to stimulate the electrodes. Uh, so yes, the answer is yes. For your first uh, studies, do you uh, how large was your sample size for for the initial algorithm, for example? For the first generation, yeah. For the first generation, how, how large do you need uh, the sample size to be? Well, uh, basically, the one that one was done in an offline manner. We had about 15, 20 uh, subjects for that, but it's, it wasn't practical. It worked. We had this deep reinforcement uh, learning that was basically generating the reward function, but it has to be done up. You need to collect data, go to the lab train the system and then come back out to use the system. It's not that practical. So that's why we went to the second generation to do the training in an on-the-fly online manner. And again, there was a problem. It took a long time to do it, a couple of hours, which is again, people don't like to sit down for a couple of hours uh, doing this uh, adjustment, fine tuning. And the third generation, of course, now making it uh, 
you know. Yes, doctor. Yes, uh, we are on delay. Uh, we, we we can uh, pass uh, to the next presentation. Okay. Uh, I I think it is going to be presented. Uh, the next paper is going to be presented by by Kasser. Again, I think. It's it, it, yeah, okay. Okay. Yes. Please uh, uh, share the presentation. I am online and I see the the, the, the open. Yes, I I see only the application, the PowerPoint application, with the first slide of this this presentation. So uh, I I didn't see any any. Any of the slide of the previous uh, presentation? Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. So uh, this paper is uh, uh, is about identification of, of of buffer maps. Okay. It is going to be presented by Nasser Nasser Antenas. Thank you. Okay, yeah. uh, please, uh, please go ahead. Thanks. Uh, so this paper is about improving uh, identification of defecting wafer maps using data augmentation. And we are doing the data augmentation by this generative AI network, Enhanced Cycle Again. Uh, again, this is part of a PhD dissertation uh, by one of my PhD students, Lamia Alam that I'm going to present. Oh. No, I'm not. Yeah. Oh, okay. What's the problem here? Uh, when we, uh, in the wafer fabrication is the age of integrated circuit manufacturing, many chips or dyes are placed on the same wafer. Uh, and then an electrical probe test is done to see which of the dyes, which of the chips are not working properly, which of the ones are working properly. And the pattern which is associated with defective map, a defective dyes, is called the wafer map. What you see here is a wafer map. That the, the uh, yellow ones are defective, they didn't pass the probe gate. The other ones, the green ones, are good. Uh, 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 dies. Um, now, uh, the identification of this defective, there are different types of defective patterns may occur, There's, uh, and then this needs to be identified quickly to see what the problem is in the production line. Uh, but uh, what is shown here is a, de uh, is a defective wafer map called none, which associates no defect. This, this, this one passes the uh, uh, vision uh, processing system. Now, uh, if you look at a vision-based system used to detect this wafer map defects, it's a deep learning-based system. Modern system use deep learning. But the problem with deep learning uh, systems is that they require a lot of data to get trained. And on an actual IC production line, we have a lot of non-defective wafer maps, but very few, relatively very few defective maps. So now this creates a data imbalance problem when we train a deep neural network. Then any type of deep neural network can be used, VGG16, ResNet, all the classical uh, deep, uh, a neural network. Regardless of which one is used, we need to make sure that the data is balanced. What people have been doing to make the data balance, they've been using generative uh, AI networks. Deep fake, you may have heard, basically generating synthetic data from real data, and so that to make sure that the number of samples per class are more or less the same. Uh, so 
In our previous work, we compared three types of generative network, GAN, uh, DAE, and CycleGAN. These are very popular generative AI network, and we showed that CycleGAN uh, generates better synthetic, what I mean by better, synthetic images that are closer to real images than other types of generative network. We also came up with our own generative network called Enhanced Cycle GAN to improve the creation of these synthetic images. And we use two uh, simil this uh, similarity matrix as part of uh, Cycle GAN framework. This is basically the structure, the architect uh, architecture of Enhanced Cycle GAN. We have uh, this network basically does a min-max problem. We have two generators, uh, two discriminators, and we have loss functions. And uh, the standard cycle again minimizes, uh, this looks at all this loss function as uh, solves the min-max uh, problem. And we came up with this enhanced cycle again. We modified the cycle consistency loss by adding two structural similarity uh, measures into this uh, 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 cycle consistency. Um, this is the standard, what you see here, L1 losses, a standard cycle again. This is the two additional uh, similarity matrix or losses that we added to a standard cycle again. This is the database we use. It's a very popular database. It has about 800,000 wafer maps. Only 170 of them are labels. What you, what you see here, basically you see that for non, non-defective, we have lots of samples. But for some of the defective ones, we don't have that very many samples. The red ones, there are not that very many. So if we use enhanced cycle again, we can generate enough number of uh, samples to be able for a deep neural network to do a better job in identifying these patterns. These are the nine patterns, uh, defective patterns in, uh, in the database. Uh, so what you see here is uh, real and synthetic data, what is generated by samples uh, uh, generated by enhanced uh, cycle GAN for four of the uh, defective uh, patterns, do not near full random scratch. Though these are the ones that don't have that very many samples. Then we looked at this matrix, four matrix, to see how close synthetic images come to real images. In other words, how realistic synthetic images are. So this, these are used, these measures are used in image processing, basically to see how close uh, two images are. Uh, peak signal to noise ratio, SSIN, uh, KID and FID. So if two, uh, the, the difference between two, if PSNR and SSIN are higher, that means more similarity. If these two may, Matrix are lower, again, that means more similarity. We want this to be higher. We want this to be lower, these two uh, matrix. So we did this uh, study. Um, so one matrix alone would not do the, basically we cannot rely on a single metric. So that's why we are looking at multiple metrics to see how realistic our synthetic images are. So these are the results here between real and real. So that establishes the baseline. Enhanced cycle GAN and real. The standard cycle GAN and real. And we see that enhanced cycle GAN generates synthetic images that are reasonably close to uh, real images in terms of this four matrix of uh, similarity. And then we said, okay, we have these synthetic images. What impact would it make uh, on identification? 
So we use VGG16 as a typical identification model. We trained it with and without data augmentation, with and without synthetic data, and see what the difference uh, you know, uh, would be. Uh, all the, the, we only do the training for the last layer. The other ones are trained based on ImageNet, the, all the convolutional layers, ImageNet data set. So there are two cases here, uh, train without data augmentation, train with data augmentation, and then again, train without data augmentation, tested on real and synthetic uh, data, train with data augmentation, tested on real and synthetic data. If you look at these averages, you see that if we do, the, if we add the, this synthetic data, our vision-based inspection system does a better job. In this case, for the case one, from 80% identification to 86%. And in case two, from 54% identification rate to 92% identification rate. And then these are, can be shown that these are statistically significant improvement when compared to not doing any data augmentation. So data augmentation, in fact, helps this vision-based inspection system. Uh, so what uh, we've done in this work, we use our own uh, previously de uh, developed uh, uh, generative AI network. We called it Enhanced Cycle GAN. We use Enhanced Cycle GAN to generate uh, synthetic data, defective maps. Then we looked at four matrices, matrix uh, to see how close synthetic data come to real data. Uh, and we showed that they, they are realistic. They gen, uh, these synthetic data are relatively realistic compared to other uh, generated AI networks. And then uh, we uh, looked at the impact of data augmentation on identification. And we saw a positive impact when we add synthetic data in addition to real data to do the identification. And these are the uh, references. Okay, thank you. Uh, do you have some questions? Yes, uh, the people attending they are on Mexico City. Uh, the matrix, you use the standard matrix for this kind of domains? Yeah, these metrics are widely used in image processing to, to see, to look at similarity of images, in particular, structural similarities. But yeah, these are, there are other matrices, a uh, matrix too, I should say, matrix too, but I think the important thing is not to use Many of them are similar to this. They are reflecting more or less the same thing. Uh, the important thing here is that not to use a single matrix to, to do this uh, uh, study. So that's why we looked at four widely used matrix. And for each one of them, this table, for each one of them, the uh, enhanced cycle GAN came closer to real images compared to other type of generative AI networks. So you, you can put the slide uh, with, uh, yes, yes, no, no, yes. can you expand this? No, no, no. Uh, when you put the percentage of, yes, this one, because uh, the, the fifth one is uh, 54%. And this contrast contrast with the results of the third of the second. And this one will go together, yes. those two go together. Yes. So basically, here for this case, for example, near full is zero. If we do not do any data augmentation, if we just use what is available to us. Now, if we generate synthetic data and the uh, do the identification from zero, it goes to 
and then we take the averages. These are the this is the averages of all of this. Thank you. For the generative model, are you using the same data set time for the classification? Generative? For yeah, the I mean, them, it's the same data set? Yeah, I mean, the, for the real, uh, we use real as the input to the generative model, we generate synthetic. Then for the, uh, for the identification, we divide into 70, 30%, 70% training, uh, uh, for the generative model, so are you using the, the whole data set? No, no, only a portion of it that we are going to use because then only the ones that is used for training okay. from that 70%. Yeah, right. To avoid leaking, right? Right. The 30% is put aside. That's for testing. Yeah, yeah, that was my real. Yes, that's, that's just put aside. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Past experience in this area, um, I can see you have different applications which have an industrial flavor. Yeah. Um, and uh, it, it seems that there is no limit to all these techniques uh, to solve problems that are hitherto not well managed by previous techniques and so on. Uh, do you have a view or a personal view of where would you like this area to go in your particular type of applications? Actually, we are looking at other applications. Generative AI is a very powerful way of filling gaps when we do not have enough data. So there are many, many applications I can be I'm also looking at a, a, a wind energy problem that we don't have enough data. Can we generate realistic, synthetic, but realistic data to allow the utilization of deep learning models? So generative AI can be used as the front end to a deep learning model to generate adequate amount of data if data is not available. In some applications, plenty of data are available, but there are applications we don't have enough data, especially maybe for one particular class or for one particular kind of like the defective map, we may not have enough data. So the generative AI is a very powerful way of doing data augmentation before using a deep neural network. Okay. This kind of techniques also been applied for astrophysics because it's kind of similar. The telescope, the is web telescope, because the images are with a very low quality and they employ this kind of uh, algorithms. I see. Yeah, I mean, I mean, if, uh, generative AI, you know, so lots and lots of papers are being written, basically uh, generating synthetic data. Of course, some people are also using it in a sort of uh, negative way. Deep, uh, yeah, deep fake is yes. an example of that, generating deep video data, deep audio data, or fake audio data, fake video yeah. data. So, it, but if for industrial applications, there are many cases where uh, data is becomes the bottleneck. And so, uh, and this is a very powerful, I mean, as I said, you, these days, you find lots of papers, people using, especially GAN model. GAN is the most popular one. The great majority of papers you find is using GAN, a standard GAN. Some use cycle GAN. Of course, we use enhanced cycle GAN. Uh, so, uh, yeah, yes, it, it's being used extensively, these things. Uh, in the last couple, two years, maybe also stable diffusion for, instead of can. Yeah, diffusion. Uh, this is low. The bomb problem, yeah. of course, we have a paper which is already submitted. Compare the diffusion model to some of this. So there are pluses and minuses. But our enhanced cycle, again, we've shown, again, it's already been sent to publication, does better than diffusion. Yeah, this image are. Uh, kind of simple, so I guess it, the, 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 it's enough to can 
also, for example, I work with autoencoders. Maybe also autoencoders could be enough for that kind of. Uh, yeah, you know, VAE is an auto in the variation on auto. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah right. VAE is, that's, that's what it is. Again, uh, regardless of which generative model is used, we need to make sure that we come close to real images. So that's the very first step. Before we use it, we use this synthetic data to train anything. We need to make sure that these are indeed realistic images. And then once we establish that, then going, you know, using some uh, deep learning model to train uh, some deep learning model. Yeah. Yeah, the, the last part uh, I think is the most important one. Uh, to improve this uh, classification algorithm because in many cases they don't improve too much, but in this one it's it's a very large difference. Yeah, it, it, it depends. We've seen it in problems that suffer from data imbalance. It makes a big difference. Problems, the difference is only, say you have 10,000 samples, a few hundred samples for some, it won't make that much of a difference. When you have a data imbalance, mm -hmm. then the difference becomes substantial, it becomes statistically significant in terms of the improvement in identification. So it depends. Um, yeah. Okay, no more questions. So, So we uh, we are uh, we finish the the session of today. Thank you to all the speakers and the uh, attendants in in Mexico City. Now uh, tomorrow is the, se the second session of computer science and computer engineering at uh, one p.m. in the same room. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I apologize for the delay. Uh, it's uh, a problem. This uh, new version of uh, Teams. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Adrian. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. But the last one is uh, quite a... Uh, yeah.